Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are taking up testimony on H273 today, which is an act relating to promoting racial and social equity in land access and property ownership. And we're continuing to take testimony. These are folks that were suggested to us, um, not just through seating power, but also through testimony that we've taken with respect to um, par perhaps parallels to existing legislation like the Working Lands Initiative, um, but we also had some testimony that I'll ask uh, Nick to, to address uh, specifically. <clears throat> um, but I just wanna welcome uh, Beverly Little Thunder who is here today, not in your role for the Commission on Native American Affairs, but as your role in uh, seating power and your, and your group, um, of Kunzakea um, Tomokoche. We have Jessel Port here from Duxbury. Um, <coughs> matter of full disclosure, I'll just say I, I, know, I only know Jess through The Alchemist, where she works, where my <laughs> wife works for The Alchemist Foundation. Um, but I do not know Jess through her work here that she's going to testify today. And apparently, Barbara Murphy and her one degree of separation. <laughs> Uh, no, it's Antoine. So, um, in the case of being a small family, uh, welcome everybody. So, um, Mary Howard, can you start us off? I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Representative Mary Howard. I represent the uh, southwest portion of Rutland City, District 5 3. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but um, thank you for coming. <coughs> Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I am uh, Representative Chip Troiano. I represent <coughs> Hardwick, Standard, and Walden in the Northeast Kingdom, and I'm the Vice Chair of this committee. Welcome. Representative Matt Byron uh, from Virgins, represent my municipalities in Northwest Addison County. Representative Lisa Hango, Franklin 5, Richford, Berkshire, Franklin, and Highgate on the northern border with Canada. <laughs> Tiff Gloomley, representing uh, the south end of Burlington. John Kalaki from South Burlington. And for Nick, I'm Raindrop's dad at the bar with your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Joe Parsons. I uh, represent Newberry, Topsom, and Brown. Hi, John Vladzik, and I represent Milton. Hi, I'm Tommy Waltz. I represent Berry City. Representative Barbara Murphy. I serve Fairfax and District Franklin, too. And Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury, representing Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Beals Gore. Um, so Nick, we have you leading off, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about, I mean, I, I imagine you have some prepared remarks, but I, the, the focus of our questions may end up being, um, we did take testimony about how Vermont Land Trust works with, in particular, works with um, at the Abenaki to provide access to their land. So I just want to learn more, definitely want to learn more about that and how that's going to how that may apply to, and, and not just Abenaki, of course, but to the indigenous groups across the state and, um, and how that applies to this particular bill. But so welcome. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. It's, it's good to be with everybody. Um, I just want to check and make sure you can hear me okay. Um, I'm, I'm in a new setup for me, so coming through well. Um, and I'll just start by saying, um, Antoine is also a very good friend of mine. And we're reconnecting via Zoom after a long, a long period. So Antoine, it's great to see you too. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, it's really great to be in here and have a chance to um, speak with you all today. Um, I think I'll just say to start off that uh, the Vermont Land Trust is extremely supportive of this bill. Um, it's, it's long overdue um, and it's a really important step forward towards equity and justice in our state. Uh, the Vermont Land Trust has worked to conserve hundreds of thousands of acres in Vermont, about 11% of the land in Vermont uh, overall. And a very small portion of that land, it was conserved with the participation of, um, or is now stewarded in the sense of landowning by owners or, or stewards who are um, people from historically marginalized communities, black people, indigenous people, and other people of color. And it's a really important thing that we work together to change that um, and really make uh, enduring strides forward as a state around this set of issues. Um, 
you know, for all the reasons that I think you've probably heard testimony on um, at length uh, over the course of your, your hearing testimony around this bill, and I'm sure the other speakers today are going to point to. Um, but land, we, I mean, to, to sum it up, land access is a human right, um, and it hasn't been equally apportioned in this state. And we can take a step to recognize that. And then I think this bill um, is a really important way for us to, um, to do something about it, to really take action. Um, so we're, we're very much in favor and support of the bill. Um, and I think, you know, just I'll say too, there's great infrastructure and support out there, um, I think, to help to facilitate this funding getting out and also um, leveraging other funding sources that are available so that we can make a bigger impact. Uh, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, I think, is really committed around this set of issues and could be a great coordinating partner um, if this board were to be established and this funding uh, were to get allocated, which we you know, uh, sincerely hope that it will. Um, and also, the Vermont Land Trust has been the recipient of funds um, over the last year dedicated to BIPOC land access and land sovereignty. Um, and there's a real expectation and hope that that funding uh, will be leveraged many times over uh, to create broader social change and equity. Um, and, and ultimately, that's not something that philanthropic sources can do on their own. So I think it's a great, you know, great step to um, be moving us towards, uh, towards some support and some action by the state in this regard. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say too, I think it's you know, ten million dollars uh, in some ways sounds like a lot of money. I think it's, you know, in many ways we should consider this a really important and small first step, um, and one that I, I hope will, will grow over time, um, and that we'll be coming back to this committee and others to advocate for, hopefully, um, if this bill uh, succeeds. Um, but I, I know, Representative Stevens, that you really asked me to come in and talk about the land access work that we've done with the Abenaki. So um, I can uh, move into talking specifically about that. Um, it's been a really exciting piece of work. And I'll just say, you know, we know that we're not doing it exactly right or, um, you know, have it all figured out by any stretch. Um, but there are some things about the approach that we're taking that I'm really excited about and I think are yielding some really good results. And so I just wanted to take a few moments to highlight those. And then I'm happy to you know, just have a conversation with you all about it, um, answer the questions that you might have. You know, so the first, the first, I think, really key point is that rather than sitting in the offices of the Vermont Land Trust, which are the stone's throw from the legislature um, in Montpelier, and trying to imagine what we think a good land access provision might look like, we engaged really deeply in conversations with um, with members of the different bands of the Abenaki here in Vermont, and also with unaffiliated indigenous communities and community members to really talk about what are some of the barriers to land access that are most critical to address and how can a land access provision on Vermont land trust owned lands begin to address that. So it's really at the start, a project of communication dialogue where we work together to shape a provision that is most going to meet the needs. And I'm really excited that, and um, proud of the fact that we started with the approach in that way. Um, the, second, the second piece that I think was really valuable about how we ended up, how we approached this, the process of it, is that we made, really made no attempt to put any kind of standard out there or definition out there about who qualifies to consider themselves indigenous in terms of the access rights that are available on VLT lands. Um, we just made an affirm affirmative statement, uh, and we can provide a copy of that uh, land access policy. Um, I'd like to provide a copy of it to you as um, to follow on my testimony. Um, but the provision basically states that we're recognizing that this land is historically part of Indakina and has been stewarded by indigenous people from time immemorial, um, and that there's a history of exclusion and, um, and marginal, marginalization on that land that needs to be addressed. And so therefore, we're creating this broad access right for members of the indigenous, of indigenous communities to gather medicine on properties that are owned by the Vermont Land Trust, to gather for ceremony, 
uh, to walk those lands, to hunt on those lands. And there's a, there's a, a few other activities that it covers. But the basic tenor of it is to say, these lands are yours to access. And we recognize your claim. Um, and that that is going to be, you know, that claim is going to be honored permanently on land that's owned by the Vermont Land Trust. And then we list off a, a particular set of properties that are actually the properties that we own. This can be for confusing for people, and I'll just put it out there now that of that 11% of the state of Vermont that we have you know, some relationship with, the majority of that, the vast majority of that is conservation easements where we're holding the development rights. We've taken the development rights on that land um, through conservation restrictions. That's not what this policy applies to. It applies to the smaller set of lands. It's about 30,000 acres and Vermont Land Trust is the third or fourth largest private landowner in Vermont, um, but it's a much smaller number of uh, acres. It's a much smaller amount of land than the close to 700,000 acres. That's the total conservation portfolio. Um, I will say as our last sort of opening piece is that the establishment of that policy has been really well received by the bands of the Abenaki, um, by our partners and- I just wanna say hello. Hi, Peter. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it's led to really great conversations with some private landowners as well um, who wanna follow suit, you know, who've seen that affirmative right put in place and are interested in putting something similar in place on their land. So we, we expect and will facilitate conversations that will support the different bands in establishing affirmative access rights with other private landowners who have conserved land um, over the years to come. All of that work, I think, Again, it's just a step in terms of where we need to go, but these are, these are pieces of work that we've um, undertaken in the last year and a half that have really you know, yielded something uh, sub substantive and positive that we're really excited about. So Nick, in terms of identifying land, um, we heard from Rich Holshue last week who talked about um, being able to buy uh, BLT, I believe, was able to buy the land, the three quarters of an acre around the petroglyphs or some of the petroglyphs in, in um, southern Vermont. And I just wondering if you could spend a few minutes just talking about what the process is when it comes to buying land. So, for instance, in, in Act 27, in, in, in H273, there is um, a core value. Express that that this group would buy or help people buy land, and um, or there's a group that's mentioned that says well that 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 will buy land in every town. Um, my my impression of VLT is always that it's it's been very reactive in the past where land may become available and then BLT might work with local, local folks to help facilitate the purchase of, and protection of that land. In a case like this, this almost sounds more proactive in H273. Does that, I mean, and, and so how would, how would a group go about finding land that was that, you know, is it just gonna be an open market search or is it, <laughs> Somebody says, "I have this land available. I'd love to, um, I'd love to sell it." Much like what just happened in, El in, in the Elmore area, where hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of acres were just transferred. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I I think that um, I, I always like to say responsive rather than reactive, just because reactive has a negative connotation to it. But I think that in a lot of ways, you're right that. Um, the work of the Vermont Land Trust begins when some entity or stakeholder comes to us and says, we have a desire around a conservation or a land related outcome, will you work with us? And that is what happened in the case of the Elnu and our great partner, Rich, um, and the project there that ultimately led to the purchase and the holding for now, the petroglyph site that we're doing on behalf of the Elnu. Um, in, in every case with the base of the Abenaki, we're working on land 
specific land access projects of different kinds right now that have been in, oftentimes have been identified by members of the band as being significant in a number of different ways. There are also sites, you know, we're using um, state archaeological data and other um, resources so that when um, potential conservation projects come our way, when somebody's interested in donating a conservation easement or donating a piece of land, we are doing some screening to say, you know, is this possibly a site of historical significance, specific historical significance to the Abenaki? And when that happens, when that comes up, we're then engaging with the Abenaki around, you know, what a land sovereignty or conservation outcome could be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's been, it's become more proactive in the sense that I think we're being, we're a lot more attuned to and aware of um, the need to think through the lens of historic harms and indigenous ownership and sovereignty of this land, and then thinking about where are the right moments where that comes together and could lead to partnership with one of the bands or another affiliated group. Um, in terms of the, the idea of that is stated in the bill around um, safe space and um, you know, a place in every town, I think that I think what that's referring to is the Everytown project, which um, yeah, Ken, Kenya Lazuli may have been in to speak with you already, and and we can't be supportive enough of the work that every town is doing. Um, they're affiliated with the Nifo Land Trust, a great partner of ours, and I I do think that there are opportunities and needs to create sp safe space for historically marginalized communities in a bunch of different ways in every corner of Vermont. And I think we have a mental model that says that that can't be true because maybe because there, you know, it's historically been such a small percentage of the population or there are places where that's not relevant. And I just fundamentally disagree. And I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of energy around this idea that safety and access is something that, that needs to happen everywhere. And every town I think is just doing really important and good work to elevate that and to um, create projects that represent that. And we're actively working with me folk in every town on, on several projects right now too. Can you, and I'm gonna ask this of all of our witnesses today um, to provide us with that definition of safe space when it comes to what you're, what we're talking about here. I mean, I, I can think of, I, I have a definition of what safe space may be for me, but can you, and, and again, I'm gonna ask every, I'll ask everybody the same question because I think it's, it's important when we talk about the desire for these places to be developed over time, not developed, but found and created. Um, yeah, Nick? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, that, that's a question that makes me very uncomfortable um, to try to answer on behalf of other people, because I've never felt that sense of that lack of safety uh, in a white community in Vermont. Um, it's not my experience. I, I do think that's a really important discussion and that there are leaders out there um, who are very prepared to discuss that at length. And I... Um, and to come up with some really good proposals about how we define it. I do think the establishment of this fund would be a really important step towards creating those spaces. Um, and that's something I really strongly support. Uh, Nick, I, I, I have a hard time understanding what the it is with the agreement with the different bands. Sure. Like, what is, because I think that that's germane to the bill as well. So I know, I, I heard you talk about this at the beginning of your process, and today it's really lovely to see a year later where it's gone. But what is the agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think that we don't have formal MOUs with any of the bands around a broader partnership at this point, and that might be something that we work towards, something that's written down. Um, I think really what we have at this point is relationship and a set of activities that we've done together, a set of projects that we've worked on together um, and I, I like to think, uh, I believe we're working towards in good faith, uh, a much deeper level of trust between the Vermont Land Trust and members of the bands so that 
we can be effective partners together. Um, then the it that comes out of that is, you know, tends to be more specifically around projects. And so, you know, I think there's a, a good example is the Nulhegan Tribal Forest, which I think was completed in 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, that's owned by the Nilhegan Band of the Abenaki. It's got a conservation easement on it that we steward. We've done some work together to make improvements around access um, and you know, hopes to do more around expanding the size of that parcel and, and potentially um, bringing other par parcels into tribal ownership. Um, with the Elnu down in the southern part of the state, we were just talking about that project, the, you know, the securing of these, this three quarter acre petroglyph site. So it's now protected, it's, it's named. Um, there was a naming ceremony a couple of years ago that I had the privilege to attend with the chief of the Elnu down there um, and, and many other stakeholders. Um, and it's you know, currently owned by the Vermont Land Trust, but we have every intention and there's, there are agreements in place with the tribe, sorry, with the band to transfer that land to them um, when they have the capacity and resources in place, not funding, but just the ability to steward it, um, then we would transfer that land over. So um, those are some examples of you know, what the specifics of those partnerships can look like. You know, the, the third thing, which is I spoke about, which was our land access agreement, is something that I could, again, I can share um, a copy of it with you following my testimony. And that, you know, just as a, as a broad affirmative access right that exists for all of the land that we own. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's it's sort of project by project and effort by effort at this point as the conversation continues and, and, um, and opportunities arise. But I think, I think more structured partnerships could definitely come from it. So you're not granting exclusive access to the land to some of the tribes. Other publics can also go onto the land, or I, that's what I'm trying to un understand that, that part of it. That's right. It's not. It's not exclusive. The um, the rights around gathering, probably around gathering medicine, are exclusively called out in the affirmative the affirmative access right for the bands and, and for indigenous people. So um, that's not something that we typically would grant. Um, the, the right to hold ceremony. I mean, you know, many of these things, it would be an interesting conversation if somebody came to us with a different affiliation and said, I'm curious and I would, you know, I'd like to do something that is a, you know, a ceremonial use of land that the Vermont Land Trust owns. That's something we'd have to consider. Um, so yeah, I think I think the key point, and this is what we've heard back from the folks that we've worked with and um, with the bands, is that you know just naming these rights and tying them to an historical lineage and legacy here is really important um, for valuing uh, the identity of Abenaki here in Vermont and strengthening um, the support for that relationship to land. And you said in the beginning, it wasn't just the four recognized tribes, but it's anyone who's self-identifying as indigenous. Is that correct? That's, that's right. There are many members, many, many people who come from indigenous heritage here that are not members of the Abenaki bands or have a similar, similar lineage, but don't, um, don't identify with those bands or with those structures. So we want to make sure that this that these rights were inclusive of those folks as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any further questions for Nick at this time? Thank you, Nick. Um, I didn't want to go into gory detail about, um, though I may at some point want to go into gory detail just about the process of what, what it takes to uh, when someone does come to you and and and, and wants to preserve land um, and what the process might be, you know, all the interrelated parts. Do you receive money when you're doing conservation for land that you're purchasing on your own? Um, do you receive money from the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund? Uh, the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund contributed to the Nalhegan project. I'm not a, and 
I'm trying, to, I'm not entirely sure if there may have been a contribution to the project with the LNU as well. Um, I can check that and get back to you. Um, so but in general, does it land trust ever receive funds that are more general usage than individual access than the, than the easement rights? I, can you try the question one more time? I'm not sure I get it entirely. So when you are when you are purchasing this out of these thirty thousand acres that are under your the land trust's control, yeah. Um, was when you're when you're trying to put a deal together a, a purchase together, um, are you eligible to receive funds from the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund? Or does that come from, uh, you know, in the case of the Noel Higgins, they really applied and, 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 and they went their own way down that road? Yeah, the, the uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund uh, would only very rarely um, uh, contribute funds directly to the Vermont Land Trust to support these projects. They do, but often, most often, um, What's happening is we're working with a partner, and that partner is the recipient of funds from the trust fund. Okay. No, that's 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 helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, you're free to stay. Obviously, this is a conversation we'll be having for a, for a little while today. Um, I'm going to move next to Beverly Little Thunder. Beverly, welcome back. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Beverly Little Thunder. I am from the Lakota Nation, uh, Standing Rock, North Dakota. Uh, I always tell people that I was traveling on I-90 and missed the turn to head north to my own town and turned north and wound up in Vermont. And <laughs> to my surprise, I love Vermont. I absolutely love Vermont. Um, let me begin by saying that you know, I talked with an elder recently when I was back home and she said to me, if you want to preserve the earth and take care of it, then you have to begin with the earth in your own backyard. And that gave me something to really think about, you know, thinking about how food is obtained in the system you know, it's primarily based on creating a, a dependent consumer model. Uh, and our needs are determined by government, large corporations, agribusiness, politics, and media marketing. And what that results is, is that people suffer from diminished health and health care, uh, poor air, water, soil quality, and overprocessed nutrient values. I want to be a prosumer, if you would. I want to grow my own food. I want to have my own garden. And I am 74 years old. I have lived in I don't know how many rental spaces. And each time I've lived there, I've put a lot of effort into starting a garden. I cannot tell you how many times that I had to leave that garden because the rental period ended. I've never had a permanent place that I could pass my garden on to the next generation. And this bill is aimed at helping people like myself acquire a home base, a place where we can grow our own food if we wish, raise chickens and have eggs, where we can create genera a generational wealth by being able to pass the stewardship of that land down to future generations. And I heard Nick talk about ceremonial spaces. And I am very fortunate at this point in my life that I live on a piece of property that we were able to obtain after 
searching for four years. We've been here 16 years and we still have not been able to pay it all off. We lived without running water, electricity, sewage, in a drafty, drafty, single wide mobile home with our granddaughter for close to five years before we were able to get enough money saved up to have our home built. And so on top of our land, we also are paying a mortgage. It's a great strain because now at 74, I'm not working. I was a nurse for 42 years. I could afford that. Now I can't. And this land would not have been purchased had it not been that my partner was white. Because every time I inquired, the door was shut. I want this land to go into trust when I pass on to my next generation, on to the generations that come after that. I don't want a Walmart built on this land. I don't want to see it developed. I want to be able to walk on this land and, and harvest the many medicines that grow here. That is my dream. And I see this bill as creating that dream for those people who don't have the ability to even get on a piece of land, who don't have that initial down payment, who may be struggling once they get on a piece of land to learn how to steward it in a good way, who want to learn how to farm, I don't know where to begin other than sticking a seed in the ground, which by the way, is a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> However, this bill would open that door so that others like myself wouldn't have to wait until they were 74 to begin to realize this dream of land stewardship. I am very connected to the land. And one of the things that we do on the land that we're taking care of is we do hold ceremony. Every summer for two weeks, this becomes a ceremonial ground for any native person anywhere in the United States to come to. And we usually have up to a hundred people who come. You talk about safe space. When I first moved here, I was very, very apprehensive. I saw nobody in this town that even remotely looked at like me. I got strange looks everywhere I went. And people seemed afraid to talk to me. It was not until I went to a town meeting and a a table full of old farmers. They look like old farmers. I'm just assuming they were, you know, with the pants, <laughs> and plaid shirts, and, you know, the typical uh, garb for a lot of Vermont men. And they said, hey, girly, which took me aback because I haven't been called girly for a long time. Oh, said, okay. Did you move up there on, on that road? Are you, are you the ones that are living on that land there? And I braced myself and I said, yes, I am. And one of the most rugged looking ones said, then you're responsible for those drums we hear. And I said, yes. And another one said, you know, I get up in the morning and I get on my tractor and those drums just make my day. And they uh, went around the circle and they all talked about how wonderful it was to hear the drumming and singing echoing through these hills. I sat down and I realized at that point that it was going to be important to develop a relationship between the residents of this town and myself. It would have been really helpful if I had had 
other BIPOC people to come and support me and be there with me outside of the two weeks that we were here for ceremony. I think that that's important for any BIPOC family that moves into an all white community, which let's face it, that's the majority of the towns in Vermont. And they need that support. I think that human beings, once they get to know each other, they find more similarities than they find differences. Is that to say there's not racism in this town? No, I wouldn't go that far. But the majority of this peop the people in, in the town of Huntington where I live are incredible. Incredible people who like myself care about the land, care about their children, care about the environment, care about what's happening in our state. That makes it a safe place for me. There are those times when I don't feel safe. Every now and then someone will come racing through town in a big pickup truck. And I don't sleep well that night, wondering if they're going to come racing up our hill. We live pretty remotely. We have a big dog, but the big dog would probably show them where the silverware was. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still that level of fear. That's level of fear of two older women living alone. Um, when we talk about safe space, you have to have allies around you. I now feel that I have allies that I can call on in this town, but it's taken 16 years to get here. I want people who move into a new town to be able to talk to their neighbor about what were the best crops you grew? How, you know, how did you, how did you manage to amend the soil not using pesticides? What's the school like that your children go to? How do I talk to white teachers who have predominantly white students and don't have a clue as to how to relate to a child of color. All of those are things that I think of when I think of a safe space. And when I think about this bill, I see that it is one that can provide support in so many areas. And it is so long overdue. The people of color in the state deserve to be able to have a piece of property that they call home, that they don't have to worry about starting a garden and, and having to move. The people color in the state deserve to have that support. And you're right, Nick, $10 million sounds like a lot, but it really isn't when you think about the money that can be put into trainings, the money that can be put into helping someone get the equipment they need to, to run their farm. Most people of color, the land trust is great, by the way, but most people mm -hmm. of color don't wanna move on to 10 acres of forested meadowed land with nothing to live on or in. I did it, it's not easy. And for someone with a family, it would be next to impossible. I remember panicking when I stepped outside my tent and the dog's water bowl was frozen. It was like, we've got to get shelter quick or we're gonna be frozen. So, Buying a place that has a structure on it is really, really important. And with this bill, this will help a family do that to at least give them a start. Give them solid ground to, you know, to stand on. And it is a step towards reparations. 
it is a step towards undoing all that racism has taken away from us over the last 100 years, 200 years. It's not giving us anything. It's helping us. We're not asking you to give us anything. We're asking you to help us. Help us create this board that will be made up of our peers that will decide who gets a grant for what. So many times, you know, we apply for grants and it's an all white board that has to decide whether we're worthy or not. That needs to change. We have very, very qualified people in our communities that can handle that amount of money and responsibility. And with this bill, that's one of the things that we're, we're seeking to develop. I think I went beyond the 10 minutes I was given, but <laughs> I thank you very much for, for listening to me. Um, you have to understand that at this age, I'm frantic to develop something for the next seven generations to hold on to. And it, it's, it's a passion of mine. And I don't want a young family with a child or two to have to put in a garden at a rental and have to leave it just about the time it's ready to be harvested. Lamia, thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, we're gonna move to um, Jessica Laporte. Um, Jessica, welcome, the microphone is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, I know that I have a time constraint, but I wasn't sure if there were questions for Beverly. Um, I think we're all sitting here moved by her comments right now. Um, and we can ask, we can ask um, if she has questions. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you had room to speak as well. And, 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 and Beverly, just to be clear, um, as far as we're concerned, that's a 10 minute that was 10 minutes. Legislative time is a little bit different. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then. Well, I will jump in. My name is Jessica Laporte, and I identify with she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm a resident of Duxbury, Vermont, which now means that anyone who is listening probably um, would be able to identify where I live. Um, <laughs> I was asked to testify today by collaborators across various groups involved in advocating for this bill, including seating power. And I was asked to testify on behalf of myself as a black woman born and raised in Vermont um, and living here now. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. I'm a member and organizer with the Vermont Relief Collective. As Tom mentioned, I work for the Alchemist. I am newly co-leading the community resilience um, organizations with Mindy and I'm a board member of the Stowe Land Trust. I also organize with people for police accountability in Burlington and participate in local racial justice groups like the Racial Equity Alliance of Lamoille County and Waterbury Area Anti-Racist Coalition, uh, which are both where I live and work now. Um, and that doesn't quite cover it all. <laughs> um, and I am here as myself, which means that I cannot re represent all of the experiences of people of color in Vermont, other folks who grew up low income, especially not the perspective of those who were here, but were economically, socially, or forcefully pushed out from this state. Um, for those of you who have, who have served in the legislature for a long time, you should at least be familiar with what happens to black female political leaders in this state when they speak the truth. Um, I am here as somebody who was raised below the poverty line but has recently surpassed it. I have stable housing, thanks to my sister <laughs> and my family. I am here as somebody who wants to live in Vermont but does not see a financial future that would allow me to purchase a home here. 
not at all unrelated to the fact that I am married to somebody who has still yet to immigrate to this country. Um, I'm here as somebody who knows that the clearer I speak the truth and stand up for actionable, effective racial justice and anti-oppression and policies, the less likely I will be able to peacefully and safely live in a small town in Vermont. I came here to tell the truth and to be honest, while also knowing that testifying as an individual means that the consequences of my honesty leave only me exposed. And I can't help but wonder what it would be like if all of your witnesses and those offering expert opinions throughout these committees and testifying on behalf of all kinds of bills were here in as personal, personal of a role as myself. Uh, since I'm talking as myself, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. <laughs> My sister and I, who has already uh, she has already testified to this committee, uh, we grew up in Stowe, Vermont, uh, with a single mother who is a career, a career waitress, bartender, and now caregiver. And so you could say that I grew up poor in a rich town. I was raised in the house where my mother was raised, a house that my grandparents originally purchased with about 100 acres and sold all but about two of those acres to make ends meet while raising 10 children. In 2017, my mother and her siblings sold the house and split it as their only inheritance. Eight out of 10 of those siblings still live in Vermont, and five out of eight of those siblings in Vermont are land or property owners, and my mom is not one of them. Like many who grew up here, I left Vermont for a while. I went to boarding school, took a gap year, went to college, and then I lived in Haiti for six years, which is now my other home. Um, and when I moved back to Vermont in 2020, the pandemic had just hit and the U.S. went through what was a bit uh, too short and too shallow of a racial reckoning. Because of my intersectional identities, I've had the incredible opportunity in this return to Vermont to engage in spaces of reimagination and community that are curated by and for people of color, like the Vermont Relief Collective, the Everytown BIPOC Land Matching Committee, and Unlikely Riders. I've been encouraged and learned from imaginative models like the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, the Susu Community Farm, the Global Majority Healing Collective, Conscious Homestead, obviously Beverly's work, <laughs> um, and Space, um, and many others. These are BIPOC-led cooperatives forming across the state that center reconnecting BIPOC with the land and improving their health and well-being. These spaces coupled with my time in Haiti have reshaped my understanding of most things like my basic needs and my vision for the future. And they have given me a space to acknowledge and express how wholeheartedly disappointed I am with how consistent structural and interpersonal racism is today. Each and every single one of these initiatives has had to jump through hoops and face opposition because they don't fit into the white dominant capitalist mold that, and then they are discredited or undervalued by the outsiders who hold the keys to finances, legal status, and other resources. So when I think about why I support this bill, I love that the bill itself holds a lot of that language. To quote it, this bill proposes to promote racial and social equity in land access and property ownership by creating grant programs, financial education, and other investments targeted to Vermonters who have historically suffered from discrimination and who have, had equal, who have not had equal access to public or private economic benefits. Quoting again, wealth disparities are a function of not only access to income, but the ability to access land and property ownership. Wealth disparities directly and indirectly affect the health and wellness of individuals and communities. I believe H-273 is needed because the existing programs for housing equality and access don't adequately address the unique needs of BIPOC Vermonters. And they aren't offered and approached in ways that are supportive of people with those identities. They often don't acknowledge that it is harder to get support in those institutions and organizations that are white led and white dominated. As somebody who grew up in a poor white family, my sister and I are the only people of color, I can tell you that 
the unique need, my unique needs do not match those of my mother, her siblings, or my cousins, many of whom were or still are low income. I love this line from the bell. The relationship between all persons in the land has been used to oppress persons over the past several centuries. The laws and policies of our state and nation severed indigenous persons from their land while denying them. Black persons and other people of color from having the opportunity to access land. It's a hard truth, but it's the reality. I also love this line, just transition to an economic system that systematically undoes racism instead of reinforcing it. Um, efforts to remedy wealth disparity in the United States have traditionally looked to free market economy solutions to answer the very problem that it has created. Doesn't, doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? If we are turning to the same systems that have created the problem. For me, H273 is a, is a bill and an opportunity to carve out space for BIPOC to guide the process of increasing land access and property ownership for their own community. It directly contrasts and begins to address the structures and practices that brought us to where we are today and that divorce BIPOC from the land. And um, it, it creates a pathway to keep this work going into the future. We've heard some legislators hem, legislators hem and haw about where to put this fund, how much money should be in it, who should manage it. And honestly, instead of picking away at half with half, half truths, why don't we start with being honest? This bill isn't palatable. Some of you don't in fact believe that systemic racism is real. And some of you that do believe that it is real aren't prepared to sacrifice and push for this bill to counter the strong inertia around racial inequality in our country and in our state. Some of you have proposed that this fund be integrated into the Working Lands Enterprise, or I've heard mention of other bodies that um, work on land and housing equity. Um, it really makes me question if you've read the intent and findings of this bill because H273 is about BIPOC people being able to exist on land in Vermont, predicating their worthiness of access to land on operating a business in their community limits, uh, creates unnecessary contingencies. I support looking at the model of working lands to see how money can be dedicated to certain things and those mechanisms could be used but they need to be used for a different purpose and they need to be managed by different people. Um, as a board member of a local land trust, um, I've unfortunately confirmed a lot of my suspicions. While land conservation can allow for ecological stewardship and public access to land, because these easements and structures were developed without indigenous consultation, they often further restrict indigenous access and practices on the land. And I'm glad to hear that VLT and other land trusts are looking at ways to start to rectify that. But in contrast, new folk in every town are being designed with that at the center. Um, and something that is really important is long lasting relationships to land. I think about the generations that Beverly is hoping to, um, to sow into. Um, I think that uh, something else that's really interesting in a land trust model is that affordability mechanisms, which are mostly placed on working lands, really hold a narrow view of working lands, of farming, of food production that require um, profits, <laughs> profit generation, and don't leave space for those who are growing food and medicines for other purposes. At the end of the day, land trusts are a way to hold land wealth and no inclusivity initiatives about how the outdoors are for everyone directly address land wealth inequality. The current land trust model is a very effective wealth management tool. For in order to economically benefit from land conservation, you have to already own land. So land owners get paid money to protect that land, so sell the rights to development, without actually relinquishing their rights to control over that land. They're in the driver's seat to negotiate what public land use looks like and what conservation stewardship is going to happen. That's why for me, the Everytown BIPOC land actress process could not fit into the land trust mold. It means that 
they're actually trying to put land and trust in perpetuity that involves giving land back to BIPOC and relinquishing control. So I, I feel like I've had many things to say. And at the end of the day, I really truly believe that H273 not only is fundamental to begin the process of shifting our relationship to land and actually making space for BIPOC Vermonters to be here and stay here. But I also think that, I also think that if it's approached in any way that doesn't acknowledge the existing infrastructure, networks, communities, initiatives that are led by BIPOC in this state and actually puts the stewardship of this funding and these mechanisms in their hands, it's not doing its intended purpose. Um, so I really encourage you all to, to pass this on um, intact and to preserve those elements of this bill. Um, I want to live in a future Vermont where people of color don't have to fight to stay here and have pathways to put down roots when they might not have white family members like myself. And I know that our existing BIPOC led initiatives are prepared to absorb and steward this work. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Jess, can you, um, you mentioned about the number of different cooperatives <clears throat> that are that are sprouting up across the state and, and BIPOC run co um, cooperatives and that is in fact an economic model or a business model that we do not have a lot of experience with. Can you spend a couple of minutes to describe um, how that working model is for us? I mean, I, I mean, I have a general idea of what it takes, which is, but it is, it is rare enough that we don't have automatic supports for it in place. All the you could use them to relinquish control. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, I think cooperatives, there are so many different forms of cooperatives because they might be being enacted in different spaces. There are um, worker-owned cooperatives that may be within a business model. There are collectives and, co and cooperatives that are around land stewardship. Um, some are around food production. Um, so it's really broad, but I do know, um, you know, just as one example, a space like Conscious Homestead, which is an urban BIPOC um, food uh, project and community center, um, you know, they are legally, this is why I'm saying when I say that there's friction between the imaginative ways that these groups are seeking to exist and the existing system. So you have to choose, are you for-profit or non-profit? <laughs> It, and there's often a lot of pressures and push to grow to a space to be able to, you either have to be able to employ people and generate enough profits, or you have to be fully charitable. And there aren't a lot of great ways to bring those two things together. And I think a lot of cooperatives are kind of similar to that. And I do know that um, some of these collectives have chosen not to pursue um, you know, nonprofit status um, or formalize under a specific structure. And honestly, the individuals who steward those end up paying the, the consequence uh, when it comes to all of that income being considered um, individual or self-employment income. So, um, you know, there are there are farming cooperatives, there are business cooperatives, there are all different forms. I think that just in the ones that I think have been proposed to this committee as potential um, groups to testify, as well as those that are named in the bill to receive the funding are non-traditional organizational models. Well, thank you. I, I, and I know that's just a thumbnail sketch, but it's just important for us to hear. Um, to, to begin to understand the differences. Um, my, my overt co I can name, you know, Washington Co op for electricity, Hunger Mountain Co op for food, groceries. Um, but that's, we're, it's not that we're talking about something different, but we are talking about something um, much more specific than, than those larger organizations. So thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any further questions for, for Jess right now? All right, we will move in, in committee. Um, we're just gonna work through till 245 today. Um, what's that? Yeah, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna break. Yeah, we're not gonna yeah. break now. We're gonna yeah. work right through till 245. Okay. Um, so finally we have Antoine Williams, um, who's been who's been waiting patiently. Antoine, welcome to General Housing Military Affairs. And we've asked you to testify on 273 and and um, as a financial advisor, I'm sure I would expect that you're aware of the wealth disparities that we talk about when we're talking about these bills. And I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on 273. You're right. Well, it's it's my pleasure first to be here, and I'm I'm honored and 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 um, feel so happy to be able to talk about this. Um, as you as you know, or as most of you know, uh, my name is Antoine Williams. Uh, I have a financial planning firm. Um, that's a financial planning and wealth management firm. Uh, a little bit about me, which is interesting, is, is I grew up in New York City and I was fortunate to have housing stability only because my father was a Vietnam veteran. I like to say that I was afforded a lot of opportunities because I was the black family, uh, the black family in the middle uh, affluent building. Um, but my father and my parents did not have to worry about home ownership because they had an apartment that my mother still lives in in Midtown Manhattan. I, I mentioned that because as a financial planner and a wealth manager, my job is to help people make smart decisions with their money. And, and what's so important about this bill is it's talking about land ownership. When we talk about wealth management, and I, and I talk to people about wealth. The interesting thing about wealth is the vast majority of it comes through home ownership. The vast majority of my clients were able to have, or have been able to and have afforded things because their forefathers who had lands passed it on to their children who pass it to their children who are now passing it to them and I'm helping them foster those going forward. When we get the definition of generational wealth, we're really, it, it's, it refers to assets passed by one generation of a family to another. The question is, what happens if you don't have the opportunity to ever purchase a home? And therefore you have assets, but your assets are there to just sustain themselves and just to pay the day-to-day -day bills that we all have. How are you in that situation supposed to have generational wealth? The thing that, 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 that makes me so proud of what you're trying to do at this point in time is trying to find a way for there to be a beginning. There needs to be that opener. I've got five clients right now out of state that are trying to move to Vermont. And one of them told me yesterday, in order for me to buy a place in Chittenden County in particular, we will need to spend 20 to 25% above appraisal value. That is absolutely ridiculous. And the scary thing is, we're talking about a very small population of people that will mm. ever be able to afford a place that will not allow them to have full financing. So again, I I'm really here more than anything else, hopefully to answer questions um, and to be support and support a bill that is looking to help ease the burden of the of the of the wealth gap in this country by allowing people BIPOC uh, people, Black Indigenous people of colors to have a better chance, a higher probability of being able to earn that first step of wealth generational uh, wealth generation and the first step of stability, which is owning a home. I mean, when I heard the question of of safe space, it it, it was interesting. Um, Beverly uh, almost brought me to tears. Jess, what you're all saying is so much so profound. And when I think of the word safe space, safe space to me is just a place that you own that you don't need to worry that people want to push you out of. And for most of us people of color in the state of Vermont, um, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, it's, it's ironic as someone who, I, I, when I look at the bill, I kind of laugh and talk about how this is such a beginner step. $10 million is really relative. I, as an advisor, manage $180 million. 
So we're not talking about a lot of money. We're talking about, a, you know, a fifth of the money that, I, that my firm manages alone is what we're talking about. That's not significant at all. But it's a first step. And we must walk before we run. And, and this hopefully is that, is that beginning step. Um, I'm more than anything else hoping that, that, that those of you who have questions can ask me, uh, ask me uh, about my thoughts, about what I do. But again, you can hear the passion here is about allowing us to not only be able to afford land, but also to have people who look like us who are able to make those decisions. Because I laugh, I'm often I'm invited to speak at conferences. And the funny thing for me is oftentimes I'll go to a conference, sit in a room, not get paid any attention to because I look different. But then when someone mentions our speaker from Vermont, Antoine Williams, then all of a sudden I get a lot of attention. And, and it's like a lot of things here. It's, it's unless you're dealing with or unless decisions are made by your peers, it's kind of hard to get the benefit of the doubt. And oftentimes, as Jess was mentioning, as Beverly's mentioned, as Nick has mentioned, oftentimes the results are, are, are not as positive as they should be. And it's just not fair. So Antoine, we took testimony. Thank you for your comments. Um, we took testimony and in, in, in the statistic that's been shared with us by um, more than one person is that um, a, a white person and a black person side by side, may, both making $100,000 a year. The reality is, is that while their salaries are the same, their wealth differential is, again, one fifth of a black person's is one fifth of that white person's just as almost as a rule. And so that's not a new situation, unfortunately. But how do you, um, and, and we've heard, especially in relation to this bill, how much, how important land ownership is to wealth. And we, we, we only have to look at the increased prices of real estate over the last 24 months to truly understand that, to see it clearly. But when you work with someone who is in that position, if you're working with someone who is making a, a good wage, who wants to, you know, who wants to start planning for their future and has to start working up that ladder um, of wealth accumulation? Where do you? How do you start with them? One of the beginning parts is it's kind of is to work on increasing their emergency reserves, lowering their debts, and trying to think about the future. But at the end of the day. Home ownership is a big piece of that. The reason why, if you were to think about it, the reason why if we've got the two people who make the same amount of money, but the wealth gap might be five times different, has a lot to do with generations. If I, as I am, was probably the first generation that will allow my kids to inherit wealth, well, if my parents and grandparents were able to have and afforded to have the opportunities I have, we'd be able to equal that. So, so at, at, to go back to the, the, the answer to the question is, it's, it's typically to save money so that they can put down a down payment for a home. And that's probably one of the hardest things for people to do, is to be able to make enough money to make ends meet, while at the same time putting money away to save towards the future, but also accumulating enough, again, so that they're able to take that first step after being approved to put that money down to say, now I've got, um, now I've made a deposit, now I've got a home, and now they've got that base wherewith things can, can prosper. And that accumulation of wealth, if, if it works to that plan, um, <clears throat> you know, we've had a pretty negative history with, um, how lending institutions, very much a part of the system. Um, I mean, there's plenty of stories from the last 12 months of, of um, people of color having their house shown or, or appraised and then substituting themselves with a neighbor who's white and having the same house be appraised 20 to 25% higher. Um, 
that tells me that there's an innate bias at the very least when it comes to that particular piece. Do you, again, if someone comes to you and says, I, my house was appraised at this level, I think it's worth this level, what, how do you work with them? You know, at that point, we, we, we might go forward and see what we can do and see if we can increase it, but, but that's just it. Oftentimes, there's not much that you can do at that point in time, except for going forward. <clears throat> so at that point, how much advice can I give? I can only give so much advice because I'm not the person who's in control. And that's where the systemic racism hurts. It's, it's if someone, I laugh to my wife and, and all the time and say, hey, if I'm walking, if I'm in Shelburne in my suit, uh, the, the way that I'm looked at, it's very different. I'm the same guy, but if I'm wearing cut off shorts and Nick and I were coming from doing a triathlon way back when, Nick, um, and, and, and I'm not in a suit, all of a sudden people don't look at me the same way. So as a financial advisor, can I help that? No, I can't. I can't help that, but I can help, help them try to make better decisions going forward. But again, the thing that's, that's pertinent here is, is to enable people to have the opportunity to own land, to own something that will be theirs, um, something that if they're able to maintain themselves and live throughout their lives, that they can pass to their next generation. That's by definition, generational wealth, the transfer of wealth from one to another. And for most people, and it's what I see right now, I laugh and say, there's an amount of money that we manage, but for every client, that's got $100 or $1,000 or a $1 million or 10 million, they'll have equity uh, in homes, a primary residence, or if they're lucky, a primary residence and a place in the Cape or a place in New York that, that is at least equal to what they have in a retirement account. And that is where the wealth disparity typically is. It's I can make the same amount of money as someone else can during their lifetime. But all the assets that we have as a family are the assets that we brought to the table. We weren't aided by anyone else. And a lot of times that aiding just has to do with someone having a house. Nick Richardson, has your, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I um, I just really want to like appreciate your um, painting of that picture, Antoine, and I think it really ties back to the um, testimony that um, Jess gave, um, which I really appreciate. And I just want to endorse um, because of um, I mean what I've what I've come to learn is just how pernicious um, and um, and all, encompass, all encompassing uh, structural racism is. And I think that this is really important for the integrity of this project and this process for the mechanism that's described in the bill around decision-making and the, the sort of full BIPOC ownership uh, and decision-making on that board um, is really essential. And I, and I think that um, the history that Antoine is alluding to and describes around patterns of marginalization, of seizure, of land theft, which are, in, we have the, as white people, we oftentimes have the privilege of that not being visible to us. And yet it's so fundamentally true. Um, I just think that those are really important points that I'd like to I'd like to make sure get reemphasized here as we move towards the end of this testimony that the mechanism by which the state of Vermont chooses to do this is just as important and maybe more important um, than the particular amount of money that gets allocated here. Is that a blue one? Yeah, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, 
in part the the, the big challenge of um, a bill like this because it is really envisioning <clears throat> a different way of doing things and um, um, <clears throat> outside of kind of the control of you know the systems um, that. Um, <clears throat> That we've constructed. So I, I, I think it's a really, really important <clears throat> um, piece of the legislation, um, and uh, and I'm I'm glad that you highlighted that. <clears throat> Is there? I guess I my I had just one question. <clears throat> given that you've all listened to one another as well, is there anything that <clears throat> that um, that you haven't said, any of you haven't said that you would want us to know <clears throat> um, before we have to break. <clears throat> Jess? Yeah, um, I wanted to emphasize that uh, I think the vision of every town and um, other groups that are really already without financial or structural support, um, these BIPOC led groups that are already creating what their community needs. Um, the vision is for every town in Vermont, for people, of color of all walks of life who have come to live here in Vermont for all different reasons um, or who wish to return here. Um, and for me, I think that, that the vision being expansive is not, it, it speaks to why it's prohibitive for so many people economically to afford to live in Shinde County, which is the county that's associated with the most racial diversity. And so it's definitely needed there. But where it's also needed is for Beverly and myself living in rural Vermont. Um, and quite frankly, I'm going to look to these communities to make that um, longevity possible on the social, political, like interpersonal level. And that is the kind of like, care and attention to detail that um, funding and resourcing these networks to continue their work, to not start their work. This is the state saying, we want to partner with what is already being built and expanding across the state. And I think that that's something that's really important about this. Thank you. Beverly? Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, also mention that, you know, we, we our, our focus is BIPOC people, um, but we're also talking about people who are of mixed heritage, of people who are uh, disabled or differently abled. Uh, we're talking about people who are uh, non-binary, transgendered, gay, lesbian, um, all of those are people that are part of our community. And all of those are marginalized communities. And I just wanted to, you know, to emphasize that we're looking at the whole gamut of people who don't have access and who don't have a hope of ever having access of having a home or a place where they can pass on to, to the next generation. That's all I wanted to emphasize. Thank you. I just wanted to say, going back to the chair's question to each of you about safe space and not to put any one of you specifically in the spotlight, but I have to say, Jess, that I think we all, if we in any way question structural racism, need to think about your words that even just being here to speak to us isn't necessarily a safe space that that it, that's the reality and, and I I was a classmate of the individual I think you're speaking of who came to our legislature and wasn't able to stay for the safety of her family so it's a wonderful reminder that we we do have a privileged place 
each and every one of us and some more than others. And to forget that and to think that everyone just has everything we have um, needs, needs to be jostled. So thank you. All right, any further questions on this bill right now for these witnesses? Representative Trout. I just have a question for you, Beverly. If you don't mind me asking, what kind of responses, when you were trying to finance uh, your home, what kind of responses did you receive from the banks? <laughs> don't mind me asking. I mean, you made a point that that was very difficult for you. And I'm just curious as to how banking played into this. We wound up not going through a bank. The owner agreed to finance it personally. So we don't okay. make payments to the bank. Okay. That Have is the there? only reason. Yeah. That's the only reason why we're still here. Because with with COVID and everything that has happened, um, our <laughs> initial landowner has been very, very generous, very accommodating. Uh, but going through a bank was impossible. Did you try and did you, were you rejected or did, what were yes. your feelings about that? Yes. What reason did they give you? Oh, various reasons. Our, our uh, income to debt ratio was too high. Um, we didn't have, when we first got here, we didn't have long-term jobs, obviously. Um, we weren't established. Uh, you know, different reasons like that. And, at, you know, at some point, you just, you say, wait, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. And I did have a small home that um, I purchased in Minnesota. Um, in retrospect, it was one of the sub uh, mortgaging uh, things that happened a number of years ago, um, but I got out and I did have a very small um, uh, equity in that. And my partner wound up cashing in her 401k and everything that we had went into the down payment on this, on this home. Um, so, you know, it was, even now, going to finance a car, I'm always having to be the second one on, on the, the mortgage of that. It's my partner who is able to secure a loan for things like that. And I have to say, you know, generational wealth. She's an only child. She's a white only child from the DC area. Her mother's 85. When her mother dies, she's assured of a large chunk of money. When my mother died, I got a bill for the funeral. And that's all I got. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of disparities in being white and being from a native family that was, was very poor, that struggled. Even though my mother got her degree at 63 in social welfare, even though my mother was a veteran of World War II, she was not able to even get into any kind of a home until 1978. And then it was such a dump that when she died, it was almost given away and demolished. So yeah, I don't like banks. I'd rather put my money under the mattress or in my piggy bank. <laughs> Hope that Have you met <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can help. The um, you know what? I, I was going to mention. I, I was going to mention something there quickly, which is important to hear.
because I, I'm a guy in finance and, and even in the world of finance, which is, which is, you would think it's, it's, it, it's math. One plus one is two. But when it comes to certain things like a making a, an approval, it's still arbitrary. There is that, there is that this person's numbers are the same as this person's. And now it's to interpretation. And, and that's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because in that situation, um, a, a, a bank or, or an institution, it's very easy for them to hide behind that feeling and say that you weren't accepted, which is unbeknownst to you that someone of lesser financial picture received the job or, or got the house or et cetera, or et cetera. So again, I just wanted to put that out there that, that sometimes it seems um, that we're talking math and math is math, but, ma but that isn't the case. It's human nature oftentimes to take care of those that look like yourself, that that's probably, that's, that's in us. And that's important for someone of color. My wife and I, who's, who, who we have a, a mixed race family, but oftentimes we're having discussions and, and, and she every once in a while will have to say, I forgot Antoine, that's right. That is something that you need to think about. And I'm like, you're right. You, you don't even know what you don't know, luckily, because you haven't been brought up that way. So even this, the, the land piece, this is important, but the part that, that Nick brought up and I'm gonna bring up again is, is this is this is so important, but it's just as important to make sure that this is set up in a way that there is a a and an a and as unbiased a group as possible that's able to control this so that the uh, intended consequences will be achieved. Mm -hmm. Because you can give $10 million uh, in a fund and with a group of people that don't want to give the money away to a specific group. And all these, all the best intentions were great, but there will be no activity because they they pull the strings and make the approvals. Yeah. I also have to say with the last name Little Thunder, even without seeing me, that's a detriment. Mm -hmm. And you know, racism is alive and well, even in our in our policing, in in every aspect of you know, of our lawmakers, it is alive and well. I always tell the story about, we have an old Mercedes and the back light, tail light went out. My partner who is very, 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 very white, drove that car back and forth to Burlington. I don't know how many times with the tail light off. She bought mm -hmm. a new tail light and put it on the dashboard and kept saying she was going to change it. I got in the car one evening just to drive down to Richmond. And don't you know, as soon as I was on the road, I got pulled over. Why? Because my taillight was out. I was questioned and drilled and held up for almost half an hour before I was allowed to continue with a threat. If I see you again with that taillight not fixed, I am going to give you a ticket. Maybe if I had a blonde wig on, I don't know. I, I, I felt like it was very, very, uh, very profiled. So. Well, thank you all. Um, we have to end here for right now, but I wanna thank Antoine and Nick and Jess and Beverly for your testimony today. Um, really appreciate hearing on, on page 273. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. My pleasure.